All right. So we're in chapter 15. We'll talk about solutions today. <clears throat> Uh, those are the general topics, but you'll get to see those again later, one at a time. So as a reminder, what do we know is a solution? Actually, a solution is anything that we can classify as a mixture. And not only that, but a homogeneous mixture. So wherever you look in the mixture, you find the exact same percent composition of its components. That's a solution. And we have some names for those components. The solvent is usually the substance that's in the largest amount. Not always, but usually. And certainly when you begin preparing the solution, the solvent is the largest amount. The solute, and there can, excuse me, there can only be one solvent, but there can be many solutes. In other words, we can put several different components into the solvent. And the solutes generally are the smaller amounts uh, relative to the solvent. Now, there are exceptions, uh, particularly if the solutes are so soluble that you can just keep adding, adding, adding. And you finally build up to have so much in solution that eventually you've got more solute in it than you do solvent. One example is sugar water. Sugar is so soluble, you can exceed 50% by quite a bit. And, and under those circumstances, the solvent is the minor component. But since we started with the solvent as the largest amount, then we keep it, we continue to name water in that case as the solvent, sugar as the solute. And when we talk about aqueous solutions, we mean those that, in which the solvent is water. And that's gonna be our, our primary focus anyway. <clears throat> From now on. Wrong color. Black, there it is. Okay, definitions. Um, homogeneous mixtures. Solutions um, don't have to be a solid dissolved in a liquid, like salt in water or sugar in water. As long as it's a homogeneous mixture and you can identify a solvent and a solute, then you have a solution. Solutions can be made up of almost anything. Uh, you're breathing a solution right now. A mixture of primarily nitrogen and oxygen is a solution of gases. Uh, in fact, anytime you put two gases together, you always get a solution, every time, because there's plenty of room between the molecules. You've got lots of room to move around. <clears throat> you get a solution. Uh, liquids and liquids. You know, any kind of booze is a liquid liquid. Uh, ethanol and water, plus some other components. Even brass, solid solid, is a solution. Uh, brass is primarily copper as the as the main component, the solvent, and nickel is the is one of the solutes. Uh, brass has it can be a whole host of different compositions, but it's still solid in solid. Now you can't just put the two solids together and get them to mix. You got to melt them first. What was like you said like uh, soda water, like bubbles, and like uh, detergents? Like what was that exact question? It's probably, uh, it could be a gas, and a, no, that's not it. It's a foam. Mm. That's a good question. You know, in some cases, yeah, it's probably homogeneous. But in other cases, there's potential separation. Yeah. Uh, pop is a gas in a liquid. Uh, and of course, 
seawater, sugar solutions, that's normally what we think of as a solution where you dissolve a solid in a liquid. Now, <clears throat> there are basically two different types of, two modes of solution. Uh, one has to do with ionic substances going into solution, and the other is uh, non-ionic substances. Uh, ionic substances actually break apart into their individual ions, sodium and chlorine for, it, for this example, goes into water as the individual ions. Other substances, uh, if we're gonna continue to talk only about water as the solvent, then you're looking for polar uh, <clears throat> solutes. <clears throat> because uh, water is a polar molecule. Have I described polarity yet in this class? I have. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. I just want to be sure before I start rattling on about uh, polar versus nonpolar. Um, yeah, sure. Well, I thought I had it, but I can't find it. Uh, that one's Rebecca's. So here. I get polar. My polar just kind of sets there. You need the. Uh, you need just these for today. You have the other things, or do you need a copy of the review? Okay. <clears throat> I never look at mine anyway. You had a question? Yeah, I get what polar is. My polar just kind of sets there. Uh, Nonpolar has has no um, uneven distribution of electron density. That's how you get polarity. You, the electrons are distributed unevenly in the molecule. So the nonpolar, right? So the nonpolar is is pretty a uniform distribution of electrons in the molecule. Um, for example, well, water is polar, of course. For two reasons, remember? It has polar bonds, but the polar bonds are not linear. They're not opposing each other where they would cancel out. So you get an overall polarity of the molecule like that. So this is the negative side, and that's the positive side. And that polarity allows water to um, readily dissolve both ionic and polar solutes. So what are examples of polar solutes? Well, these are ionic. And that's the way you get a solution from an ionic. The attraction to the negative chlorides, and I assume this is sodium chloride. The chloride ions are attracted to the positive side of the molecule. So the individual positives are here. And this is negatives. So the, the chloride ions are attracted to this side of the water molecule. And sodium ions are attracted to this side of the molecule. And depending on which ones are approached, um, you gradually start to dislodge those ions from the crystal. And the other water molecules behind you, say you're the water molecule, they're pulling on you too. Right? So that combined force gradually loosens the ion and as it becomes more exposed, it's surrounded by water molecules. We call that hydration. And eventually, it just tears that crystal apart. Now for um, polar compounds that are non-ionic, you need at least one uh, bond in that molecule to be polar. And here's ethanol, for example. There's your car two carbons, and there's your business end, the alcohol part of ethanol. And you have, just like water, you have an oxygen here and a hydrogen there, and you get that polarity. Oxygen slightly negative, hydrogen slightly positive, and that's where the water is attracted to those positions. So you need at least one bond in the... Oh, polar, yes. 
There can be more than one. Right. <clears throat> uh, for instance, sucrose. That's a model of the sucrose molecule. And you don't have to remember it. I'm just making the point that here are all these um, hydroxyls attached, these alcohol groups. So there are plenty of places for water to attack that molecule. So that's why table sugar is so soluble. It has so many places where water can attach and attract it. So this is, this is one example where you can get more solute in the solution than you have solvent. And then there are um, nonpolar compounds like oils. You try to mix oil and vinegar to make your salad dressing. You have to shake it really hard. Yeah, like that. <laughs> shake it really hard and then pour it on your salad before it separates. Because if you shake it and let it sit, it just takes a few minutes and it's just completely separated into two layers. Because, you know, the saying, oil and water don't mix. The reason they don't mix is the attraction between the water molecules is much stronger uh, among the water molecules than it is between water and the oil. So there's a competition going on in there. Is there a specific name that we're uh, here? Yeah. It's called an interface. Yeah. Um, so we get the, um, the short version of how solutions form is in the, sol the solvent. And you have your solvent. And then you have a, say we're gonna add a solute of some kind. In order for that solute to go into solution, you gotta create holes in here for it to go. And what I mean by that, and that's the reason they have it in, in the uh, quotations, is that they're not technically holes. You just have to break the bonds of the solvent molecules among themselves. To make a place for your solute. Okay. And um, then you also have to uh, break apart the solute molecules, right? They have to be individuals. You have to make a hole, you have to break these apart, and then there has to be enough attraction between the solute and the solvent to fill those holes. So it's actually a three step process. You gotta pull these apart, you gotta pull those apart, then you have to match them together. And the, the energy requirements for each one of those steps, uh, taken as a whole, determines whether you have a solution or not. Okay, this is the way the authors put it. Uh, once you lose those water water interactions, when we're making the holes, they have to be replaced by solute solvent or solute water interactions and a nonpolar solute does not satisfy the conditions so that's why we say like dissolves like in other words polar substances are dissolved best in polar solvents and nonpolar solutes are best dissolved in nonpolar solvents Okay, uh, which of the following solutes will generally not dissolve in the specified solvent? All right, let's see what we have here. Carbon tetrachloride mixed with water. Okay, that probably doesn't give you enough information. You need to know something about the molecule. Carbon tetrachloride. <coughs> we know that water is polar so the real question is 
is carbon tetrachloride polar or nonpolar? Right. So first thing you look at is the polarity of the bonds. Right. Chlorine pulls on electrons stronger than carbon. So each bond is going to be polar in that direction toward the chlorine. And this just means that chlorine is in the back. Okay. So after you've determined whether the bonds are polar, then you say, what's the symmetry of the molecule? That's why I put those dotted lines there. Yeah. So it's, it's like a triangle formed on the bottom. And the, uh, if I had a model, I'd show you. Then you say, all right, do those polar bonds, are they asymmetrical with one another? Or are they symmetrical? Can they cancel one another out? And as it turns out, this molecule is, forms a tetrahedron. You know, it's got a triangular base and an apex, and they're all evenly positioned around the carbon molecule, so they cancel one another out. That makes this molecule nonpolar. So that means that carbon tetrachloride will not dissolve in water. But that's why carbon tetrachloride was the first dry cleaning agent. It was very effective. Uh, if it had, instead of a chlorine, it has a hydrogen up here. And hydrogen and carbon are, are essentially the same polarity. So that would give you a polar molecule in that direction. Yeah. So carbon tetrachloride is a good dry cleaning agent because it can go into your clothes fibers and dissolve the oils. There are two types of, of soil that make your clothes dirty. One is just general dirt, and the other is oils from your skin, or oils that you pick up just, you know, just from wearing them. It's very effective at dissolving those oils and just sweeping them away from your clothes. Trouble is, it's toxic, and those who the, uh, dry cleaning workers were found to be getting ill, some of them cancer, from using stuff. So OSHA and the EPA got together and says, no more, can't use it anymore. So they had to go to something else. It's less toxic, but equally as effective. Problem is carbon tetrachloride is dirt cheap and, and the new dry cleaning agents are expensive. So uh, that one will not dissolve. How about ammonia and water? If you look at ammonia, the structure of ammonia is like this. Okay. Plus, it has an extra pair of electrons up there that aren't being used. So overall, ammonia is polar, and it will dissolve in water readily. Um, methanol, that's the non-drinking kind, right. it's not ethanol, methanol, wood alcohol, the kind that makes you go blind. And that's the kind that comes off in the first fraction of a, of a distillery. As it, it boils at a lower temperature than ethanol. So um, any good moonshiner knows if you don't want to kill your customers, the first fraction that comes off of that distill, uh, you throw it away. How does that work out with Yeah, well, it's metabolized in, in several locations in the body. Uh, ultimately, the liver detoxifies. That's, that's one of its primary roles. But it also affects the nervous system. Right. Because the nervous system is, um, well, among other things, it has, remember the myelin sheath that surrounds the nerves? That's very high fat content. And uh, uh, alcohol is extremely good at dissolving into fats. It actually bridges the gap between polar and nonpolar. 
um, only uh, this one not only dissolves it, it just sloughs it away. So your, your nerves, particularly your optic nerve, um, becomes less and less and less efficient because that myelin sheath is destroyed. No, they're not connected. The liver detoxifies, right? So it takes a while to get rid of it. But separate the liver. Now you think of what does that thing do to your nervous system? And before the liver gets a chance to, to uh, detoxify, it does its damage. But <clears throat> it's polar, so it will dissolve in water. How about nitrogen mixed with methane? They're both gases. Remember what I said about gases? They always form solutions. Every time you mix two gases, you get a solution. Right. That's the easy one. <clears throat> the terminology is they are infinitely missable. Okay. Um, most solutes have a limited solubility. That is, um, there's a maximum amount of solute that will go into a solvent before you can't put any more in. Uh, even sugar, table sugar, reaches its limit. That's where you get rock candy. Right? You make a concentrated solution. You, you, you pack as much sugar into the water as possible. And then uh, you raise the temperature to get more of it in. And then you suspend a, uh, a string with a little sugar crystal on it to get the sugar someplace to, to settle. And then you gradually lower the temperature. And as the temperature drops, you reduce the solubility of the sugar and um, some of it drops out, settles on the bottom, but some of it attaches to that little crystal. And you can see the crystal grow. And over time, you got a chunk of rock candy. Now you can do that with a number of different things. I used to play around with growing crystals. Yeah. In fact, at one time I had a special, this neat little device that had a very slowly rotating arm suspended in your solution. And on the end, it had a place where you could put crystals. So I'd do something like copper sulfate. That's a good one. Saturated solution, and it had a thermostatically controlled uh, heater in it. And it would raise the temperature to a point and then it gradually reduced the temperature over time. And the thing would slowly rotate. And you could see over, over days and days and days, the crystal would grow and copper sulfate blue. So it would make this nice big blue crystal. The worst thing that could happen is your thermostat fail, the water would heat up, your crystal would dissolve and you would start all over again. And that happened. But these solutes have limited solubility in their solid. Now, uh, general terms, qualitative terms, if you have a whole lot of solute in your solvent at a given temperature, we call that solution saturated when it can't hold any more. Saturated means you've reached your limit. If you try to put more in it, it just falls to the bottom. It won't go into solution. <clears throat> Unsaturated is any point less than that. Right? You, you've got room to put more solute in there. So that solution is called unsaturated. Now, there are certain situations where you can actually put more solute into a solution than you would normally expect it to hold. But these situations are very, very unstable. Um, one way to produce a super saturated solution is to heat the solution up, uh, put in the saturating amount, and then put a little more in it. And uh, at that temperature, it will go into solution. But then you, you set the container on the bench and you let it cool gradually with no disturbances. In other words, probably wouldn't work in California because they have earthquakes all over the place. 
you just shake it a little bit and the game's over. But if it, if it settles, if it cools down with no disturbance, then you can reach a point at room temperature, say, where you have more solute in there than you would expect at that temperature. Is that why like some of like peanut butter tea, you have to pour the water first before you put the sugar in? Stir it and make it cool before you have it in the thing? Uh, that's how you get it into solution faster. Right. So you just put the same stuff in water, just enough to make that. No, you would have to put um, let's say at um, room temperature, say 25 degrees centigrade, you can put uh, 100 grams of solute in a liter of solvent. Okay, that's your saturating point. So you heat it up to 50 degrees and you put in 110 grams per liter. Right? Then you let it cool down to 25 degrees centigrade and it stays in solution. That's super saturated. Now, if you tried to, to put 110 grams at 25 degrees, it wouldn't go. It would refuse to take more than 100 grams. Right? But if you heat it up and let it cool down gradually, you can get more of it in solution. But all you have to do is say, uh, reach in with your You know, reach in with your spatula and just scratch the inside of your glass beaker and it'll come out of solution like that. It's a disturbance. Or just take it and shake it. Or take a uh, stirring rod and spin it around in your solution. That disturbance is enough to make that extra 10 grams drop out of solution. Uh, that's an understatement. They're very unstable. Okay. Uh, this is just a restatement. But what I've done here is specify solution concentration. And that's just one way to do it. Mass per volume. But we have to specify how much solvent, uh, how much solute is in the solvent. So far, we've only talked about qualitative measures of concentration. Um, we've indicated saturated versus unsaturated and supersaturated. But there are other terms that are, are operative. One is concentrated, and that's a relative amount. Just there's a large amount of solute in the solution, but it's not saturated yet. So if there are a very little solute in the solution, we call that dilute. So those are relative terms, concentrated versus dilute. And it depends on the solute and the solvent as to what those actually mean quantitatively. Right? Dilute and concentrated for some solutions could be up here. Dilute and concentrated could be down here for others. One way of describing the composition of a solution is with mass percent. So you have you have the uh, the mass of your solute divided by the mass of the solution right, times 100 or percent. It doesn't matter what the units are as long as they're mass. It could be grams, could be kilograms, as long as they're both the same units. Right? Um, what you need to recognize is that the mass of the solute is contained in the mass of the solution. Right? So if, if I say we have uh, uh, a thousand grams of water and we're going to dissolve a hundred grams of um, uh, sugar, a 
100 grams of sugar in it, the concentration then would be 100 grams per, what's the mass of the solution? 1100. That's it. Okay. That's why this one says grams of solute plus grams of solid, because that's the total mass of the solution. Okay, that's one way to describe a solution. Um, it's useful. One way that it's useful, if you need to know the composition of your solution at any temperature, mass percent works because mass doesn't change with temperature. Okay? Some of our other expressions for solutions involves volume. And of course, when you change the temperature, you change the volume. So it depends on what, what you need uh, in a particular experiment, uh, whether you need to be independent of temperature change or if temperature doesn't matter, then you could use something else that involves volume. So what's the percent mass by mass of uh, glucose uh, if we dissolve five and a half grams in 78.2 grams of water. So you have 5.5 grams is your, your uh, salt solute, but then you have this much of the solvent. Okay. Let's see, here's the answer, 6.6%. Now, uh, percent expressions are inherently open to error. <clears throat> so when we say percent here, uh, we're talking about mass percent, right? So we understood this to be mass percent, mass per mass. But if you just see something sitting alone that says 6.6% glucose, you don't know if it's mass mass or mass volume. So percent, you should always specify weight, weight, weight of the solute, weight of the solid. Okay. Because percent itself is a dimensionless number, right? Grams on the bottom, cancel grams on the top. It has no dimensions. <laughs> it's just parts per hundred. So that's why we, you need to specify whenever you use percent. Um, alcohol, uh, let's see, what would it be like? Maybe 15%, like a wine, 15% um, would be it's like alcohol by volume, ABV. Okay. So that one is actually volume, volume percent. Volume of ethanol in a volume of wine. Okay, another example of percent. And this is this is the accepted uh, explanation for percent APV. So you wouldn't have to say BV. How do you get the six point six percent? If I work it out like that, then seven thousand. Yeah, you're doing something wrong. Watch it in your calculator wrong, well, probably. 5.5 in the numerator. 5 .5 What's in the denominator? Well, it's also 5.5 .5 plus 78.2. Then you divide uh, 83.7 into 5.5. .5, and you get. 0 0.0657 is the fraction here. Then times 100 makes it 6.57% round it off.
another way to explain uh, um, pollution composition. <clears throat> and for this one, which is a very useful way for chemists, it's called molarity. And we identify that with a large M. We can use a large M because there are no elements up here with just a single capital M. Right? They've always got uh, M plus something else like uh, manganese or molybdenum or magnesium. There are no M's up there. So there's no chance of confusing that with something else. This means molarity. And molarity is simply the number of moles, and there's my abbreviation for moles, N, the number of moles per unit volume, and this volume is in liters. Right, so that's moles, and that's liters. That means molarity. So the nice thing about moles per liter is, moles means numbers of. So it doesn't matter what the thing is, it could be uh, sugar, or it could be something with a different mass, like uh, sodium chloride. But if we have mo they, moles, could be different mass, but at the same number of moles per liter, they have the same molarity. So we're talking about numbers of particles. But there again, you have this issue. This molarity is only good at a given temperature, right? The molarities are usually defined at 25 degrees centigrade. That's a, a standard temperature for molarity. Now you can establish molarity at a different temperature, but if you do, you need to specify what the temperature is. Uh, most times, uh, the expansion coefficient of water is pretty low. So if you make up a solution at uh, room temperature, whatever that temperature happens to be, you've got about a 10 degree leeway on either side where the, the difference in concentration doesn't matter that much. It doesn't change that much. Unless you're really doing really precise work, then you have to be careful with the temperature. So moles per liter is molarity. And here's an example of how you get it. Say we have six moles of hydrogen chloride dissolved in two liters of solution. That would give you a three molar uh, hydrogen chloride solution. Actually, if it was in water, like that, it would be three molar hydrochloric acid. Okay. All you need to know is how many moles of solute and what's the volume of your solution. Now that solution includes the volume of your hydrogen chloride. Okay. So in order to make, to mix up one of these solutions, the best way to do it is to have some standard glassware that's marked for a given volume. Then when you make the mixture, uh, when you bring it up the volume, you know that the solution is uh, two liters, say. And it doesn't matter what happened in the process of mixing them. Right. Um, usually when you put a solute and a solvent, uh, one has one volume, one has the other. When you put them together, the volumes are not additive. Say if this hydrogen chloride were uh, 100 milliliters worth and you put it in two liters, um, say, I don't know, maybe you did have two liters of water, then it would go into solution and you'd still have two liters. See what I mean? The volumes are not additive. Right? It's like that, the idea of the holes. <clears throat> you punch a hole in your solvent and you put your solute in it. Right, so that hole doesn't take up any more space, but you put something in there anyway. So when you put those two together, oh, for instance, let's do it this way. So you have uh, one liter of water and you have uh, 
10 grams of sodium chloride. So you know 10 grams of sodium chloride is going to be a certain volume. So when you put that together, let's say uh, this 10 grams occupies uh, 8 milliliters. Your final volume is not going to be uh, 1, 1 1.0, yeah, 1.008 liters. It's probably going to be one liter. So that didn't take up any more volume. So the moral of that story is when you make up a solution uh, based on molarity, the best way to do it is to have that glassware that's calibrated for a, de a definite volume. And when you mix the two together, once they're, it's in solution, then you can bring the volume up to that level. And you know then that you have uh, you know, two liters of solution. So let's say we have uh, one mole of sugar in 125 milliliters of, one mole of sugar in 125 mils of solution, what's the molarity? We go back to our definition. So we need moles of solute, and we have that, one mole. Okay. What's the total volume into which that mole went? 125 milliliters. But we can't use milliliters. Now, we need liters. So what's 125 milliliters equal to? One, two, three. 0.125 liters. Now you can divide. And that gives you eight molar. So our sugar solution is eight molar in this case. I left you copies of the lecture over there. Now, what if you're not told how many moles? What if instead you're told how many grams? I mean, are you dead in the water? 500 grams of potassium phosphate. Can we find out how many moles we have there? Yeah. You just, what you need is the correct molecular formula for potassium phosphate. Right? So that's a three minus charge. This is a polyatomic ion. This one has a plus one charge. So we need three of them, right? So there's your formula. You can find out the uh, molar mass of potassium phosphate. You just go to your periodic table. And you have 39.10 for potassium times three. And you have phosphorus, 30.97. And then you have four oxygens. You add them all together. Let's see. Try that again. Twelve point twenty seven grams per mole. Now we can take that five hundred grams and convert it to moles. So grams on the bottom, moles on the top. The grams cancel and leave us with moles. I get two point three five five of potassium phosphate. So we've got that part of our equation right here. Now we need the volume, 1.5 liters of solution. And 
and I get uh, 1.57 molar. Okay, let's see if that's what they get. Yep, 1.57 molar. Okay, so, and that's usually the way you have a mass of something and you got to figure out how many moles it is before you can do the calculation. But remember, this is a formula. So if you know two of them, you can find the third one. Say we already know the molarity and we know how much volume of it we're given. We can find out how many moles that represents. Right? If you're given two, you can solve for the third one. Or if you have molarity and you have number of moles, then you can solve for what volume that represents. Right? Just like any formula. If you know all but one, you can solve for it. Um, okay, here's an example. So you're given a solution that's 10 molar sugar. I assume this is table sugar. So there's 10 molar sugar. What volume of this solution do you need to have two moles? So we're gonna, we're given two moles and this molarity, we wanna solve for that term right there. Right, so how do we do it? Well, you can plug in the numbers and solve, or you can solve for V first. Right, move this one over here, move that one over there. Then you can plug in the numbers. Oops, just one. Okay. So that looks like two tenths, right? A liter. How many milliliters is that? Just out of curiosity. 200. Right? One, two, three. 200 milliliters. Okay. Uh, 100 grams of each. All right. The purpose of this exercise is to show you that you can have the same number of grams of one compound in the same amount of volume, right? 100 grams of each and 250 milliliters, but they will not have the same molarity for one simple reason. They have different molar masses. Because when you convert that 100 grams to moles, you get a different value for this one than you do for that one. So this is the one for sodium hydroxide. So here we're converting to moles. And here we're converting to liters. And sodium hydroxide is 10 molar pretty concentrated. Right, that would be that'd be good enough to uh, eat your skin away if you submerged your hand in it. If you could hold it in there long enough, I guess. How about uh, potassium chloride? Well, we have a different conversion factor for potassium chloride because it's a different molar mass. So it looks like we're going to have less or fewer moles of potassium chloride so the molarity should be less because we have the same volume. And that's the case. So we have a different molarity for potassium chloride than we do for sodium hydroxide. Uh, well, let's see, maybe we can get through this one. Solution A and solution B, they're both made of the same thing hydrogen chloride in solution. 
solution A has a greater concentration than solution B. Okay, so higher molarity of HCl in A than in B. So the molarity of A is greater than the molarity of B. Establish that. That's given information. Which of the following statements is true? If you have equal volumes of both solutions, B contains more moles than A. That's false. Right? Because this one is less concentration. So if you have equal volumes, you've got fewer moles. So A is false. If you have equal moles of HCl in both solutions, solution B must have a greater volume. Okay. The way to do that one is, this is equal to uh, moles per volume, and this one is equal to moles per volume, but with the moles are equal, right? So these, uh, this mole is equal to that mole, but these might be different because these are different. So what does that mean? Moles of A equals N over B of A. Molarity of B equals N over B of B. Then you solve for the common N. N equals M A B A. And N equals M B B B. Okay. So if these are both equal to the same thing, that means that you have an inverse relationship here. So if this one goes up, that one goes down. So what are the conditions? If you have equal moles, solution B must have a greater volume. Equal moles, A is bigger. So A goes up, B has to go down. So if this one goes down, that one has to go up. So B should be a greater volume. B is true. Now that's mathematically. Intuitively, you're saying, all right, this one's the dilute one. So it actually takes more volume to give me the same amount of moles. That makes more sense. That's more like a proof. This is intuitively, if this is less concentrated, it means you have less moles per the same volume. So if you have equal moles, you've got to have more volume to give you that same number of moles. All right. That one's true. Let's see about this one. To obtain equal concentrations, you must add a certain amount of water to solution B. If you add more solvent to B, it just makes it more dilute. Right? So really what you need to do is add more solvent to A and dilute it until they're equal. So C is false. Adding more moles of HCl to both solutions will make them less concentrated. Well, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> it makes them both more concentrated, right? All right, so B is the only true one in that bunch. Okay. So for, for any solution, say you have um, uh, one molar sodium chloride in aqueous solution, that is in water. We use this uh, parentheses to show that sodium chloride is dissolved in water. And this is its concentration. Now, what happens to sodium chloride in water? It breaks apart, right? So these are aqueous. Here, aqueous. So what does that mean about the concentration of each of these? Well, there's one of those to one of these. So this concentration is one molar sodium ion. And this concentration is one molar chloride ion. 
So what's the overall ionic concentration? Two molar. That's very important to recognize for the safety of your patients. Okay. If you think you're making an isotonic solution, but you make it with an ionic compound, then it depends on how it breaks up. If you think that's isotonic, then you're going to be off by a factor of two, and you could kill your patient. Of course, nowadays, of course, they make those solutions by 40 milligrams. They're pre-measured. I guess they kill too many patients decided, oh, we better fix this. <laughs> Don't leave it in the hands of our uh, doctors and nurses, especially not the doctors, right? What's the purpose of a nurse? Keep the doctor from killing the patient. Right? <laughs> okay. So here's another example, 0.25 molar calcium chloride. So how does that break up in solution? Calcium chloride, right, equals one calcium ion with two plus charge and two chloride ions. Right? So if this is 0 0.25 molar, what's calcium concentration? 0 0.25 molar, but it's one to one. But the concentration of chloride is 0 0.5 molar because it's one to two. Okay? So the overall concentration of your ions is 0.75 molar. And of course, we're assuming that <clears throat> since this is a chloride salt, that it completely goes into solution. And it does. That's why this is a more effective um, salt melter, I mean, ice melter, than sodium chloride. Because you throw out sodium chloride on ice, and sure, it'll make it melt. But you throw out this one, and you get, um, instead of 0.5, which would be sodium chloride, 0.25 times 2 is 2.5 you get 0.75 molar concentration here. And that dissolves uh, ice more efficiently and at a lower temperature. Okay. Which one contains the greatest number of ions? Now for a problem like this, Um, you need to uh, invoke Henry Ford. Set up an assembly line. So the first one is 400 mils of 0.1 molar sodium chloride. Let's make it easy on ourselves. What are we solving for? The number of ions, which is moles, right? So with our definition, we're going to solve for moles. N equals M V. So we need um, molarity, 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride. Times volume, which would be what, how many liters? 0.4 liters, right? That will give us the number of moles of sodium chloride. That's our first step. So let's do the rest of them just like that. That's why I call it Henry Ford. It's an assembly line. Do the same thing over and over and over again. 0 0.1 mole molar uh, calcium chloride. And that's 0 0.3 liters. And then you have 0 0.2 liters of uh, iron 3 chloride. And then the last one is 0 0.8 liters of 0 0.1 molar 
sucrose. Now we can save ourselves some, some effort here. The question is, which one has the greatest number of ions? Right. Which one makes no ions? That one. We don't have to bother with that one because there's no ions formed from sucrose. So we just need to compare these three. Now, what do we get here? This is uh, 0.4 times 0.1 is 0 0.04 uh, moles of sodium chloride. And this one is 0 0.03 moles of calcium chloride. And this one is uh, 0 0.02 moles of iron 3 chloride. We're halfway there. Now we need to figure out how many ions that represents. So this many moles of sodium chloride is how many moles of ions? Well, for each one, you get two, right? So we multiply by two ions uh, per mole of sodium chloride. This one is three, this one is four, right? One, two, one, two, three. One, two, three, four. So this one is 0 0.08 moles of ions. This one is 0 0.09 moles of ions. And this one is 0 0.08. So this one has the most ions of the three. All right. That's the way we solve this type of problem. When you have, um, when you have to do several calculations and you do them all exactly the same way, just set it up an assembly line. Once you get the first one right, and then you, you modify the information based on the same progression, then you're less likely to make mistakes. All right. And that's how they solve the problem. I already showed you that. So the point is, the solution with the greatest number of ions is not necessarily the one that's most concentrated, or which one has the largest volume. You have to do the calculations to find out. So what's a standard solution? We've assumed up to this point and when we make these solutions, our measurements are accurate. Right? But that's rarely the case. When you start mixing up a solution, there's always potential for error. So very often what you have to do is compare your solution against some standard that's been verified um, by some independent means. It could be verified by some uh, entity outside your lab, or you could have a way to prepare a standard solution in lab. So, uh, assuming that your uh, glassware and your balance and, and everything are accurate, and you've taken act, uh, precautions for eliminating contamination, um, if your solute is hygroscopic, it soaks up moisture from the air. Of course, you want to keep it in a desiccator in a dry environment until you're ready to weigh it. Okay, so then you don't have that uh, inaccuracy imposed. So you have a, a saw you weighed out, and you know the volume that it's going to go into. And what you want to do is um, you can either place the solid in your volumetric glassware. And this is typical for volumetric glassware. 
is a, a big bulb on the bottom and then a narrow neck. And the narrow neck is there so that you can easily tell when you've reached the mark that's scribed on the outside. This mark means, uh, let's just assume it's one liter. That's one liter. If you have, if you fill it up to that mark, right, the bottom of the menis meniscus of your aqueous solution, you know that this contains one liter. And that glassware is calibrated at a certain temperature, usually 25 degrees centigrade. <clears throat> now, you can either put your solid in here, use a, a powder funnel, so you don't get anything stuck to the sides, it goes all the way down. Or you can take your, your solute and dissolve it in a little bit of solid first, and then transfer it as a concentrated liquid in here. Whatever quantitative means you can use to get all of your solute in here, do it. Then you start filling it up with uh, solvent, or water in our case. And you bring it up to maybe, you know, here, what, 90%, right? Then you mix really good. Make sure it gets into solution at that point. And then you feel it. Say, did it get cold? Did it get hot? Because some solutions get really hot, some get cold. And since we're dealing with moles per liter, a volume measure, the temperature matters. So you let it come to room temperature. Just at that point, you just tap it off and let it sit until it equilibrates with the room temperature. Then once it's done that, you fill it up to the mark with your water. And 10% difference is not going to influence your uh, concentration. So that's the way we do it, to make a standard solution, and you weigh this extremely accurately. Hopefully you have a balance that has at least three decimal points. Um, actually, we've got one in, in our lab that's four decimal points. So um, this is a milligram, so it's a tenth of a milligram accurate. And if you measure with that accuracy in a large volume, then the percent error is very low. That's your standard solution. Okay. Now, what would happen if your, if your solution were exothermic? That is, when you dissolve your solute in the solvent, it got hot the volume would increase, right? And if you filled it up to this mark at that point and then let it come to room temperature, what's gonna happen? It's probably gonna shrink, right? As it cools, volume will shrink. That's not a problem. Once it comes to temperature, then you just bring it up to the mark. But what if your solution gets cold in that process? Well. Uh, you're going to bring it to the mark at cold, and when it comes to room temperature, it's going to heat up, right? So it's going to be up here. That is a problem because you can add more solute, I mean, solvent, but you can't extract more solvent easily. You, know, you could let it evaporate, but that might take forever. So, um, an exothermic reaction for a solution is less problem than an endothermic. Okay, so these are some of the things that could go wrong. You could make an error in weighing, or you could transfer uh, non-quantitatively, unless you could spill something on the side in the process of transferring. Right. You know measure at first or what's the <clears throat> Usually, I fill it up to, to right here at the bottom of the neck and let the temperature stabilize, then fill it the rest of the way. And of course, you gotta mix it. What if you put uh, a solute in there and you didn't do your homework? 
In other words, you think that uh, 100 grams is gonna be soluble in a liter, but it's not. Maybe only 57 grams is soluble. So now you've got a saturated solution, but you don't have the solution you want. That's a problem. So you need to check the literature ahead of time and find out whether what you wanna make as a solution uh, at that concentration is soluble. Okay, and they're, they're thick reference books with all that information in it. Uh, CRC handbook is a good place to go for solubility. Anybody know CRC? Chemical Rubber Company. They put out a little handbook. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, it was about, about like that and like that, about that thick. I've got a copy. It's, it's got uh, a gold edge on the, on the pages. Uh, now the book is about like that, like that, and about that thick. And uh, it, it also comes as a PDF. So that's nice. So you can search the data. Um, so incomplete dissolution is possible. You make an error in volume, right? Once it comes to temperature, you can say, just merrily squirting your water in there and it goes, uh oh, past the mark. Not too bad. You know, that's a mistake you don't want to make. Also, you could, on this neck, let's expand the neck. There's that mark. As you add water in here, it clings to the sides and runs down the sides, right? So what if you bring it up to volume here, but there's still some on the sides, it keeps flowing down and you end up there. Now you're not accurate again. Okay. So it's a good idea to, to fill up, you know how the meniscus goes like that, fill it up to your mark to where it's at the bottom of the meniscus like that. And then wait a minute and let the rest of it flow down. Nine times out of 10, it'll fill up to the mark while you're waiting. Um, the exo and endothermic problem I've described earlier. There are probably others. Those are the main ones that could give you problems with making a standard solution. <clears throat> and then of course, if you're gonna be in a, in a, a a medical lab technician, or you're going to be a nurse, standard solutions can be bought. You know, and they're, they're hermetically sealed. And when you need to use one to say calibrate an instrument, you just go to your stock room and crack the cap and pour it in the machine and let it go. But somebody had to do that to make it standard. Okay, how about dilution? What do we mean by dilution? Simply, you take a concentrated stock, a certain amount of it, and you dilute it with more solvent. So what does that do to the concentration? Add more volume, concentration goes down. Right? So typically that's what we used to do uh, when we were doing soil tests. We'd have to do hundreds of them. Um, so we, we mix up a stock solution, we call it, concentrated stock solution of the, uh, the, the chemical in solution that we wanted to use for our extraction on the soil. And then when we got ready to use it, we take a certain amount out of there and dilute it to a certain volume and give us the desired concentration. We go from concentrated to dilute, then we use the dilute one. That way uh, we wouldn't have to go through that standardization process every time to get the right concentration solution. We start from a concentrated stock. So, um, this is the central concept for dilution. Let me draw you a picture. Let's see if I got enough time. Uh, 940. So how many more slides do I have? I'm going to tell you. Six, twelve, 
Okay, I better move along. This is our concentrated stock. Okay. And we want um, to dilute it over here. This is going to be our dilute. Okay. So this is a certain molarity of the concentrated one. And we want a molarity of the diluted one to be less than that. So what do we do? Well, we take a portion out of this and we transfer it over here. And then we dilute it to the mark. So we know intuitively that if we take a small amount of this and dilute it with more solvent, <clears throat> the concentration decreases. But we want to know actually how much. So what's the same in both scenarios? The number of moles. The number of moles you take out of here is the same number of moles that goes in there. Exactly the same. The only thing that's changed is the volume. So if we know the moles is the same, what is the mole uh, ratio here? Molarity is moles per volume of the concentrated, whatever you take out. Here, moles is the same, but the volume of the dilute is different. So the volume we take out here, put over here, becomes a greater volume. Right? So these two are different. This is the smaller volume, this is the larger volume. So if we know that the number of moles are equal for both of them, we can solve these two for moles and set them equal to each other, right? Cumulative property. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. So we solve this one for moles, Like that, solve this one for moles and set them equal to each other. Right? They're both equal to the same number of moles. So now we have concentrated equals dilute. And that's how you do a dilution. This is a formula. So if you know three items, three variables, you can find the fourth one. Well, in this case, we say M1, B1 equals M2, B2. Works the same. But the reason it works is the number of moles is constant from one to the other. Same number of moles we take out here is the same number of moles we put in here. So that's why uh, MCBC equals MDBB. Let's see. We're going to have an example. So this is, this is how you would do it. You would extract a certain amount, a certain volume from your concentrated one and put it in the volumetric flask, and then you would dilute it to the volume. So you're saying similar procedures. Uh, the difference, one of the differences between doing it this way and making it from scratch is um, when you dilute a concentrated solution to a dilute solution, usually most of the heat that's generated or consumed in producing the concentrated one is now not an issue. So you dilute this one to that one, usually the temperature doesn't change. There are exceptions, right? Like a concentrated sodium hydroxide solution diluted will still get hot. Or concentrated sulfuric acid solution diluted will still get hot. But in most cases, this dilution process doesn't enter in, doesn't introduce a change in volume. Uh, so, I will skip that one because I don't want to run out of time. Let's do an actual dilution problem. We'll keep that up there for reference. So, What's the minimum volume of two molar sodium hydroxide needed to make 150 milliliters of 0.8 molar sodium hydroxide solution? So the real uh, problem or danger with using this method is, is putting numbers in the wrong place, right? So it's a good idea to 
say, what information are you given and is it concentrated or dilute? So the, the minimum volume of two molar sodium hydroxide. So the concentrated molarity is two molar sodium hydroxide. And we want to know how much do you take out of that one to dilute. So their target molarity is 0 0.8 molar. And our final volume is 150 milliliters. Now we have the numbers in the proper place. We can plug them in the formula. We can just plug them in and solve, or we can solve for BC. Like that. So this one's going to be. Let's see if anybody catches me. Nobody said anything. Why can I use 150 milliliters instead of liters? Because it's a ratio. Ratios always cancel. So I could use liters here, but then this answer would be in liters, right? Because this one canceled. But if I use milliliters, my answer is going to be in milliliters. Okay. So when you actually when you calculate the molarity of a uh, solution and you're only given moles and volume, the volume has to be in liters because that's the formula. But when you're comparing two and it makes a ratio out of them, then you can use a different volume. So that, that eliminates a uh, couple of steps. All right, so what do we get here? <clears throat> It's like 60 milliliters. And it's convenient to use milliliters when you can, especially for measuring, uh, unless your, your volumetric glassware is in liters, then okay, you can use liters. But generally speaking, uh, glassware is calibrated in milliliters. I don't know, does anybody use the uh, serological pipettes? It's a long glass tube with markings on the side for volume. Um, or transfer pipettes, volumetric transfer pipettes about this long, they have a bulb in the middle. And they're marked on the side with the volume that they hold. So you fill them up to the mark. And when you turn it loose and let it drain out, it delivers that volume. Okay. So now that we have concentrations in our quiver, we can go back to stoichiometry. Remember when we first studied stoichiometry, we were dealing primarily with mass, you know, mass and moles. But you don't have to, you're not limited to that because many reactions take place in solution. So you need to know how to use solution uh, chemistry and the concentration values we've used before to convert to moles. Right? So these are just steps. It's better if you just, if I show you. So let's say we have 10 milliliters of 0.3 molar sodium phosphate solution. Uh, let's, I'm going to shortcut this. Sodium phosphate solution reacts with lead 2 nitrate. So sodium phosphate, you have to draw the correct formula. Okay, we've got a sodium phosphate solution and a lead 2 nitrate. There's lead, nitrate, 
but that's two plus and this is one minus. So we need that one. Okay. Now that's going to react. And what you're going to have is a double replacement. In other words, these two are going to swap places. Okay. Like that. So now you're going to have lead phosphate. And this is a three minus, that's a two plus. So we have to cross multiply. Two over here, three over there. And then the other product is sodium nitrate. Now, how do you know, have we done solubility before? What you have to do is determine which is soluble and which is not soluble. We have done that. Okay. So we look at our chart, right? The, the cross reference chart. Sodium nitrate is soluble, lead to phosphate is insoluble. So this forms a solid, it precipitates out. Um, now we need to balance it. And let's see. That means three nitrates. Oh, but I only have six nitrates. That's not going to work. Let's do it the long way. So we got three here. One, one, two. And we got uh, sodium one, phosphate two, lead three, and nitrate one. So if we, I know I tried sodium already, it's not going to work. So let's go down to phosphate. Phosphate one, two phosphates here, two phosphates there, two phosphates there. So that makes two here, two phosphates, six sodiums. Okay. So now let's make six sodiums over here. That makes six nitrates. All right. And let's say um, we need six nitrates here, so that's three times two. And that's three beds. Okay, now we're balanced. Now that we've got a balanced equation. We can put in the other information that we know. 10 milliliters of 0.3 molar. That one. 10 milliliters of 0 0.3 molar. And this one is 20 milliliters of 0.2 molar. All right. So, First thought that comes to your mind when you have absolute amounts of each reactant, one of them is limiting. One of them is going to run out. So what do you need to know? You can't go anywhere in a balanced equation unless you know moles, right? But we can we can calculate moles, can't we? We just um, volume times molarity equals moles. Now I'm going to introduce a new unit of measure here, just for convenience. If we multiply molarity times milliliters, we don't get moles, we get millimoles. Millimoles. Yep. <laughs> so 0.3 times 10 is uh, 3, right? Millimoles. And this one is 0.2 is uh, uh, 4 millimoles. Okay. Now, what's the question? I haven't asked the question yet, has it? Oh, what precipitate is formed? Okay, we got that one. Here we go. And the mass of the precipitate. So we're going to need to know how much of this. So we want to convert that to that and that to that to find out which one's limiting. Right. So three millimoles, the ratio is two to one. 
So this is going to produce half as much. Millimoles of lead to phosphate. And this one is three to one. So it's going to produce a third as much. So what's four divided by three? 1.33 millimoles of lead three phosphate, of lead two phosphate. All right. So this one produces least, the least amount. It runs out, and this is the amount of actual lead that we get, uh, lead 2-phosphate. Now, in order to find grams, we need to know how many moles, right? Because molar mass is in grams per mole. So what does millimole mean? <laughs> well, a milli is 10 to the minus third, 1,000. So if we take this milli part and just put it out here, 10 to the minus three, right? 1,000, the milli. So now we have 1.33 times 10 to the minus third moles of that compound. And we need grams per mole, right? So what's the molar mass of lead two phosphate? You don't count. Not save time calculated. <coughs> okay, there's our balance equation. We found the limiting reactor. Well, in this case, I did convert to actual moles, which is fine. All right, so there we go. And next step, oops, I went too far. Here it is, 811.54. That's the molar mass of lead 2 phosphate. Then times this value, and that gives us 1.08 grams. Okay, so stoichiometry doesn't have to be uh, solid only. We can use solutions. All you've got to do is be able to convert to moles, and then you can go anywhere you want. That's the key. You're looking for moles. If you're going to travel on a balanced equation, you got to have moles. So how do you get them? You could have a mixture, right? You could have a solution here, and you can have a solid here, or you could have a gas there with a certain pressure, right? We use our gas laws to find out how many moles that is. Use a solution chemistry to find any moles that is. Then you can go traveling. It's all focused on moles because that's what these mean. Those coefficients tell you the ratio, and the ratios are in moles. And once you get the moles, you know, you can move. Okay. Um, What's the concentration of nitrate ions left in solution after the reaction is complete? Well, these break up into, they're in solution, so you've got sodium ions and phosphate ions, right? Here you've got lead ions and nitrate ions. So the lead and the phosphate combine to make this solid, and that uses up all of the lead. What happens to the nitrate? Nitrate stays in solution, doesn't it? So the amount, the moles of nitrate that you have in the beginning is the same number of moles you have at the end. But there's a different concentration now. Right? You have, you calculate the number of moles of nitrate based on how many you had, right? So we had two times this many. So we had actually eight millimoles. 0 0.08 moles of nitrate. Nitrate. But now you have a new volume, right? 10 mils, 20 mils. Actually, I can leave that as 8 millimoles. So I can uh, confuse you some more. 
What's the total volume? 30 mils, 10 plus 20. Millimoles divided by milliliters is molarity. Because this is a thousand small and this is a thousand small. So their ratio is the same. So you divide this one by that one and you get molarity. Right, nitrate is a spectator. There you go. So now we have this divided by that gives us 0.27 molarity of nitrate in that solution. What's the concentration of phosphate? Well, we used up some of the phosphate, right? So you have to find out how much phosphate did we end up with over here? Subtract that from what you started with, and then calculate the concentration again. We'll probably have to save this to uh, the review day, which is the week, Thursday. Because we're running out of time, aren't we? Oop, right down to the wire. Okay, but if you review the um, the slides that gives you nauseating detail how to calculate those values. Um, we'll have to pick up neutralization. Neutralization is, is simply an acid base reaction. I'll probably have to pick that up and talk about it again. Um, there's a new concentration normality. We'll Pick that up on the review day. Read about it. Let's see if it makes sense to you. Then you can ask questions. Okay, I guess we're done. And